For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. I've been getting a lot of requests to address a series of videos put out by the Fringe Archaeology channel Uncharted X concerning a stone vase that some metrologists measured and analyzed. Ben Van Kirkwick, the proprietor of Uncharted X, claims the results changes the game for ancient precision. What is he talking about? For those not familiar with his channel, a large part of it is devoted to demonstrating that certain ancient artifacts could not have been made by known ancient cultures. All this is in an effort to make it appear plausible, even probable, that there was an ancient civilization that we don't know about, which existed thousands of years prior to all the other ones. And it was this ancient civilization that produced these artifacts. I have already made a three and a half hour video fact-checking Uncharted X's chief claims and found them half-baked, highly speculative, and lacking hard data. If you would like to see it, including a discussion of the manufacture of stone vases, along with demonstrations, I'll leave a link below. It's called Historian Reacts to Evidence for Ancient High Technology. But now Uncharted X appears to have stepped up his game. You see, in that earlier video, I challenged him to provide convincing evidence for ultra-precise manufacturing, which he claims exists for many artifacts. Up to that point, he had provided none. But now, we have this stone vase, and people told me to go watch his video, and that this is the smoking gun I had asked for. So I watched the three videos that he made about this vase to see what all the excitement was about. I wrote down some notes, and I thought we would look at the important sections of his videos and together decide what conclusions can reasonably be drawn from these measurements and what cannot. When you travel around the world looking at archaeological sites like I do, you meet people who speak all kinds of different languages. And if you're going to find your way around, be able to get information and form relationships with the people you meet, make new friends, it's always a good idea to learn how to speak the way the people there speak. There have been so many times when I've been in a situation where I need to say something important to someone and I cannot get my point across. Once I was poring over an estimate I received in a car rental facility and I couldn't understand the charges. Because I was so ill-equipped linguistically, I completely failed at trying to communicate my questions. So I gave up and ended up paying more than I thought I should have. I decided then and there to be better prepared in the future. That is why I'm happy to recommend to you the sponsor of today's video, Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. It's summer as I'm filming this, and summer is the season of travel. Babbel is every explorer's must-have travel accessory for a reason. Its simple, bite-sized lessons give you the confidence to speak a new language wherever you go. Babbel teaches real-world conversations, not just repetition of what you might find in a stuffy grammar book. Their lessons prepare you to have practical conversations about travel, business, relationships, and more. Buonasera. E lei, la signora Marchi? Buonasera. Sì, si, sono io. Sì, si, sono io. You can easily access it on your phone. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks. And you get two free classes with your subscription. Down below the video is a link, and if you click on it, you'll get 60% off on your subscription. Babbel also offers a 20-day money-back guarantee. Welcome to the Myths of Ancient History series, in which we look at popular and particularly egregious examples of misinformation about ancient history. I explain how they employ pseudoscientific arguments and exactly why experts in the fields of history, archaeology, and science have not accepted these ideas. We cover everything from beliefs in lost continents to claims of advanced ancient technology. To begin this one, let's take a look at a few things Ben Van Kirkwick of the Uncharted X channel says about a special artifact. Our subject here is a stone vase from ancient Egypt, carved from a single block of igneous granite. 
dated to pre-dynastic Mesolithic times. That is to say, it's at least 5,200 years old and potentially much older than that. Right off the bat, we have a misleading claim. Ben states that the stone vase has been dated to pre-dynastic Mesolithic times and is at least 5,200 years old. FYI, the Mesolithic period in Egypt, usually called the Epipaleolithic, preceded the pre-dynastic period. Maybe he means the Neolithic? But it hardly matters. He doesn't mean it was dated to this time by any archaeologists, scientists, or historians. He means that the owner of the vase decided that it is a pre-dynastic vase, without any evidence other than it looks like it. Don't believe me? Watch and see. The details and analysis of this vase that you'll see in this video will demonstrate the irremediable truth of work involved in its manufacturing. The cold, hard facts of the geometric precision achieved in its creation. The implications of this truth on the debate around the existence of ancient high technology are utterly profound and entirely devastating to the orthodox claims that simple, primitive hand tools can explain everything that we see from this era in history. Wow, these are some big claims. He says the cold, hard facts that he's about to present will be entirely devastating to the orthodox claims that simple primitive hand tools can explain everything that we see from this era in history. I don't think the Egyptians had only simple primitive hand tools, but let's give Ben the benefit of the doubt and assume that he means merely that there are objects from ancient Egypt that couldn't have been made with the technology that the dynastic Egyptians possessed. I'm not even sure he knows fully what technology the Egyptians possessed, but let's see how much devastation he wreaks upon archaeology. This is why this kind of work is just so important. It's an indication of significantly advanced technology, deployed and utilized in distant periods of our past. Periods today only associated with the very beginnings of human civilization. Ooh, so he is taking this much, much further than claiming the vase exhibits tech that is beyond what the Egyptians were capable of. He's going so far as to say that it is advanced technology from a distant period of the past, long before the dynastic Egyptians. That's a tall order. At the very least, evidence like this should force a rethink of what we think we know about the people and civilizations who lived in those times. But much more likely, I think it's a clue to a far longer timeline of our species, one that involves lost, ancient and advanced civilizations that existed before the world-changing cataclysm of the Younger Dryas or the periods that preceded it. Strong claims, you might say, but I think they're warranted here. Okay, so he thinks his far-reaching conclusions are warranted. I'd like you to stop for a minute with me to think about what it would take to demonstrate all of this. Let's start with the easier claim, that the stone vase could not have been made by the dynastic Egyptians. How is he trying to demonstrate that? Let's compare with what academics would do in this situation. Most academics would prepare several lines of argument to try to establish this, but Ben is relying on one argument only, at least as far as this vase is concerned. This is the argument that the vase was made to a degree of accuracy unattainable by the dynastic Egyptians. This argument is based on the premise that accuracy in manufacture indicates the society of origin, or at least rules out the society of origin. In other words, an accuracy of sufficiently high level, a level that can't be seen by the human eye, it can only be measured by special instruments, is proof that a culture that used only hand tools did not make the object. Mind you, this is a controversial premise. It is not a commonly accepted principle in science, nor is it used by scientists as a method of dating artifacts. This is a premise that is not easily validated either, because it is based on the assumption that something can't be done. How do you prove a negative? As soon as a few securely dated artifacts made by hand are shown to have a high level of accuracy, this principle is toppled. But for the sake of discussion, I will set this aside for now and assume the principle has some validity and see how he builds on it. Assuming scientists accept the principle as valid, how would they go about demonstrating that granite or other hard stone vases were not made by the dynastic Egyptians? First, I expect they would gather up a significantly large sample size of hard stone vases from the time period under consideration, randomly selected, 
and measure them with high-accuracy instruments. Then, they would analyze the data to see how accurate, in general, the vases are, as a whole. This would give them an idea of the overall accuracy of their manufacture. Then, they would conduct experiments with the tools available to the ancient Egyptians at the time and see if such accuracy could be achieved by them. Then, they would compare the results. Then, they would publish the full data and analysis in a peer-reviewed journal for others to examine. Then, others would try to replicate their results. After that, if the methods employed and analysis pass scrutiny, then people's minds will be swayed and the prevailing opinion would be overthrown. Yes, entirely devastated. So, what did the people here do? Well, they handpicked a single stone vase of unknown origin and measured it with high-accuracy instruments. Then, they claimed the orthodox opinion was entirely devastated. Mind you, if they said that this was still a work in progress, that would be A-OK. -okay. But as you will see, they believe they have done enough to eliminate any reasonable doubt. And so do many of their followers, who told me as much. In many of my previous videos, probably most of them, I've called for exactly the type of work that is the subject of this video, applying our modern high-tech metrology and measurement tools to accurately define and analyze ancient artifacts, in particular those that display obvious signs of precision. I'm very happy to say that this is exactly what's happened here. In my earlier video, I called on Uncharted X to provide some actual measurements of artifacts to demonstrate the high accuracy he was claiming existed. So I'm happy that he is now beginning to do this. I think this is commendable and I want to encourage it. But the fact that he is picking out artifacts that display obvious signs of precision, as he says, is a red flag. This means that they are not gathering an overall picture of the manufacture of stone vases, but rather they are selecting evidence that they think will prove their hypothesis. This is not what scientists are supposed to do. They must look at all the evidence and draw conclusions about what it indicates rather than doctor the evidence to suit their preconceived conclusion. Now you might say, well, Uncharted X isn't making the claim that all hard stone vases are made with high-tech tools. He is allowing for the idea that the dynastic Egyptians made some of them. His hypothesis is only that some hard stone vases were made with high-tech tools. So of course he's going to pick out the ones he thinks fit. I'm not so sure he is saying that, based on what he says later. But let's say you're right. That suggests that at an archaeological site, where a bunch of stone vases are found together, such as in the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, there is a mixture of hard stone vases made by the dynastic Egyptians and hard stone vases not made by the dynastic Egyptians. They display the same style and form, but came from separate civilizations thousands of years removed from each other, and now they're all together. Gosh, assuming two origins seems like an overly complicated hypothesis. Don't you think Occam's razor should come into play here? I was contacted by Alex Dunn, Chris Dunn's youngest son, and his colleague Nick Sierra, who are both professional metrologists working in the aerospace industry. If you don't know who Chris Dunn is, he is the fellow who popularized the idea that the high accuracy in the manufacture of an object is evidence of higher tech than the Egyptians are believed to have had. My earlier video talks a lot about him and his substandard work of measurement. It is nice to know that his son is a professional metrologist, but the fact that he is out there trying to prove his father right is another red flag, definitely a conflict of interest. So I'd love to learn a little, bit, a little bit more about what you guys do professionally, why you're qualified to talk about this stuff, and how you have access to kind of the, the machinery and structured light scanners uh, that you've used on this vase. Sure, excellent. Um, I'll start off. So I'm probably most recognizable as uh, you announced on Joe Rogan's show. I am uh, Christopher Dunn's youngest son, Alex. I have been in the metrology field for about 10 years now, and uh, I've used pretty much every style of instrument that is available to a metrologist from CMMs to structured light scanners and laser scanners, all professionally in the aerospace field. I have no issue with any of this. Alex's qualifications seem appropriate. The vase that was scanned is um, the property of a friend of ours, and he had it scanned through a company out in Connecticut named Capture 3D, and they used a GOM ATOS structured light scanner to produce the STL file, which Nick and I then 
did a full inspection in a soft software called Polyworks. Okay, so they're just letting us know that they did not scan the surface geometry themselves. A company in Connecticut called Capture 3D did that. And they are inspecting the measurements in a program called Polyworks. The friend that they mention is the owner of the vase, and he will appear later. Alex uh, showed me this uh, the scan, and he explained what he saw to me. And uh, I have a, a degree in aeronautical engineering technology from Purdue, and uh, I'm also a licensed aircraft mechanic, um, fun fact. Um, so uh, I enjoy hands-on stuff. I enjoy, you know, theoretical stuff. And um, I've done CNC programming um, and, and machining. And then I'm also done programming for uh, measurement equipment, and everything. And okay, so Nick's field is less pertinent here. He's along for the ride. But we're not going to focus on the measurement. At this point, I have no reason to think the measurements or the inspection are faulty. Rather, I want to talk about the conclusions reached about the origin of the vase. So as, as you know, my mind sees this and I was just like, there's no way that this was <laughs> done by hand. I mean, uh, there I've seen things cut in the CNC machine that are worse than this and they're not even granite. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I dove right in um, and started applying that. Uh, analytical side and uh, again like Alex said we used Polyworks to take and extract all these features uh, from this scanned mesh and the the results that we saw were just uh, I mean you you can't explain it except with a, a machine center or, or something of that nature that could have done this. Um, and I won't take issue with the conclusions that there is no way this was done by hand and that it can't be explained except with a machine center either. Because, as I said earlier, we will assume the principle propounded by Alex's dad that accuracy in manufacture can rule out hand tools is valid. I say assume because I know it isn't valid for flat surfaces, and I'm not sure if it is valid for the roundness of vases, but this is not what I want to critique today. Let's dig a little deeper into where they found this vase. While in Egypt a few years back with his father, Alex met Adam Young, who happened to have a couple of ancient pieces in his possession, including this vase. Artifacts like this do come up for sale or auction from time to time, usually from estate sales or from private collections. So here we learn that the vase was part of a collection owned by Adam Young, who acquired the pieces from private owners. As you may know, trading artifacts across international boundaries is illegal, Laws are different for different countries, but generally speaking, if the objects were obtained after 1970, it is more likely they were obtained illegally. There is a flourishing illegal antiquities market, and this causes a lot of problems for historical investigation, as you might guess, not only because it encourages the theft of artifacts from archaeological sites and prevents us from ever knowing where artifacts came from, but also because it encourages the creation of archaeological forgeries. Fake artifacts abound on the antiquities market because dealers can make a lot of money selling them to unsuspecting customers. So the issue here is that this stone vase, having come through this market, is unprovenanced. No one really knows where it came from. If it is genuine, we don't know in what archaeological site it was found or in what context at the site. Worse yet, it could be a fake. And we're also joined by Adam Young. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for, for the time today. And just, uh, yeah, I'd love to understand how you got involved in all of this, uh, this topic, how you, um, how you met these guys and, and how they got their hands uh, on the vase and, and kind of led us to what we're talking about today. Yeah, sure. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ben. Um, Alex and I have known each other for a few years. We met through his father, of course, Chris. Uh, I've been to Egypt with Chris as well as, as Robert Schock and some others. Okay, we have the chance here to get some information about the vase from its owner, Adam Young. But one thing that stands out immediately is that he is not just some man who happened to have a vase, but he's a longtime fan of Christopher Dunn, and even has been to Egypt on one of Dunn's tours. I point this out on the odd chance you were under the impression that the work is being done by disinterested neutral parties. I had the pleasure of first going there a little over 10 years ago and saw in the Egyptian Museum, in the Cairo Museum, as well as at the sites, saw some of the precision in 
I think some of the largest structures and some of the smallest ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since then had had kind of an eye for, you know, recognizing it. And I think when you see these sorts of, of, of artifacts, like call it the vessels or the round ones, your eye can, can recognize kind of a perfect circle from a, from a distance away. Um, but once you get up close the you know, the precision in comparison to, to maybe pottery or other types of vessels is really very clear. Um, of course, what we were seeking to do is to, to measure it at a more finite level and on a much more, you know, accurate scale, but in a museum behind plexiglass, even online and photographs, you can really recognize, uh, you know, the, the extensive precision of work that must have went into yeah. to, to creating these. Here we learn that Adam, even before this vase was ever measured, had already bought into the idea that there are precision artifacts in Egypt that were not made by the historical Egyptians. Keep in mind that this vase is the very first artifact measured in this way. But 10 years ago, he had his mind made up. He believed in accuracy that cannot be seen with the human eye just by looking at it with his human eye. So this is another sign of conflict of interest. Adam, Alex, and Ben are men on a mission. And so, you know, for the past, I'd say, seven, eight, nine years, uh, my wife and I have been kind of looking for, anytime we see artifacts through through dealers or um, or private collectors that are for sale, we take a look. And if it looks like it might be pre-dynastic or impressive in some way, um, you know, we, we have been accumulating some of these things. So yeah, awesome. we probably have we probably have 40 or 50. Um, they're not all as precise as the red or the rose granite vase that we, that, that Alex and um, his colleagues took a look at a few years back. Uh, but there are, there are a number of them. Wow. Okay. So he and his wife have about 40 or 50 artifacts, which they bought from dealers and private collectors and which they thought looked impressive or pre-dynastic. And I'm sure the dealers told them exactly what they wanted to hear. And Adam apparently picked out the one that he thought looked the most precise to have it measured. This is not how science is conducted, folks. They went in with a predetermined outcome in their minds. You know, and just in, in Saqqara alone, there was, I think, forty or 50,000 yeah. found in numerous occasions. Yep. Um, so it's, you know, these things, um, to me, when anybody asks, I say that, you know, they were kind of stacked up like Tupperware and forgotten. So that tells you that, you know, it probably was easy for someone to make at some point. Adam reasons that because there were thousands of stone vases stacked up like Tupperware in a royal tomb, they must have been easy to make. Does he know that these vases were made over hundreds of years? Djoser's pyramid has vases from the first two dynasties in it. And in general, certainly I found, you know, museum curators and the, 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 the mainstream uh, museums really don't have a lot of interest in exploring the, I guess, the engineering aspects of some of these artifacts because, you know, you can just look at them behind the glass cases. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that the work you guys are doing and, and the results from this might trigger some more people that, you know, potentially have some of these artifacts and maybe even museum curators that, that might be willing to, to have some of these artifacts scanned because at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's harmless. It's not going to hurt them at all. And it's, we might actually end up learning something. Ben makes it sound as if museums are unwilling to allow people to study their objects, but they allow it regularly. It's not difficult to get access if you're doing a serious study. In fact, the fellows from the YouTube channel Scientists Against Myths went to a museum near them in Russia, Moscow's Pushkin Museum, and asked if they could measure several ancient Egyptian stone vases the museum had. Access was granted to these YouTubers. Now, they didn't have the high-tech measuring tools used for this vase, but they did have precision instruments and did the work meticulously. One thing became clear very quickly. The vases are very crooked indeed. The walls are of different thicknesses, and there is imperfect symmetry. The video is in Russian, but I will leave a link to it below if you want to check it out. We learn at least two things from this. One, there are museums with Egyptian stone vases that will allow even non-academics to measure the vases. Two, there are hard stone vases found in Egypt that were not made with high accuracy. So what we really need to find out is how common high accuracy stone vases actually are. And we've seen reluctance from, from most academics, as you can imagine, like they already know the answers, so why I keep looking, but <laughs> I think it, it can vary, you know, country to country, location by location. Some people are open-minded yep. and recognize that, you know, some of these may not have been done by hand, even if they think it's a pottery wheel or something rudimentary, they may still be open to it. So I wouldn't, you know, give up hope altogether. Okay. 
Reluctance from academics to do what? To do the scientific research for you? They have their own research, you know. If you want to do a scientific study, do one. More power to you. All you have to do is approach museums and explain your study and that you plan to publish the data, and many of them will give you access. It's not hard. But you also need to be open-minded. So word of advice, don't tell them that you already believe the vases are precise and you're trying to prove it. Tell them you do not know what you will find and are looking forward to learning something. This is, after all, the scientific approach. The vase in question is considered pre-dynastic. In other words, it was found in a tomb or burial dated to before Menes, the first pharaoh of the first dynasty, which began around 3150 BC, more than 5,000 years ago. Pre-dynastic burials in Egypt go way back from that date, as far back as even 15,000 years ago. Ben is confusing pre-dynastic Egypt with prehistoric Egypt. Prehistoric Egypt goes way back and includes everything from the Paleolithic period up to the beginning of writing in Egypt. But the pre-dynastic period begins in the Neolithic period, about 5500 BCE. I'd imagine that an easy criticism of this work might be around the provenance of the vase we're looking at. In other words, how do we know if it is really pre-dynastic? I'm personally confident that it is. It certainly matches the form and style of other pre-dynastic vases on display in museums, and it's made from the same rose granite as is the box in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. Ben wants to accept that the vase is an authentic pre-dynastic stone vase based on the fact that it matches the form and style of other pre-dynastic vases and uses the same material. Um, it's almost as if he thinks a forger will not try to make a vase look authentic. Surely he must know that if someone is in the business of making fakes, trying to fool people into thinking they are real, he will copy the form and style and use the same material. By the way, did you notice he tried to date a rose granite vase to the pre-dynastic period by comparing it to a rose granite sarcophagus from the Old Kingdom? When we get into the scan results and the analysis of the precision that's evident in its construction, however, I think the question of provenance becomes moot, as it's so far beyond even the relatively primitive capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians, at least as we know them. Well, if all you are trying to demonstrate is that this one vase was not made by the dynastic Egyptians, then fine, that coincides with the view that it's a fake. But aren't you trying to demonstrate more than that? A set of scans for one object doesn't amount to even one complete scientific study. It is not possible to draw conclusions about customs or practices from one vase. It's not possible to demonstrate how common high-accuracy stone vases are from one cherry-picked vase, nor what the skills were of the makers of the vases or the average precision of their tools. It is worth understanding a bit more about how these types of artifacts get into circulation. You have to go back a couple hundred years to the times when Americans and Europeans like the French, Germans and English were deeply involved in both governing and excavating Egypt. Many artifacts were given as gifts to officials and others were undoubtedly just taken from excavations and put into private collections, some of which filtered down to auctions or estate sales and the like in today's time. Some might even suspect that this practice has continued down to modern times, but uh, who really knows? Yes, that is true. And it is also worth understanding that archaeological forgeries abounded then and abound now, and in recent years have gotten so good that it's difficult even to distinguish them from the real things. This is why archaeologists now prefer not to admit any unprovenanced find into evidence. Until our own technology reaches a level where we can easily distinguish fake from authentic, this is really our only recourse. But hey, maybe we should give credit to Alex and Ben for finding a new way to distinguish fake from real. Assuming their first principle is correct, if they find accuracy to a degree higher than what the ancient Egyptians could do, then we know it's a fake. Ultimately, it doesn't matter to me if this vase is considered pre-dynastic or if it's from the Old Kingdom. These types of precision-made hardstone artifacts disappear from the timeline after the 3rd and 4th dynasty, and even if they are found in burials dated to that time, many of them are admittedly inherited heirlooms that are far older. This isn't controversial, it's the official line, 
as explained in the museum at Saqqara when discussing the 40 to 50,000 of such artifacts that were discovered beneath the Steppe Pyramid of Djosa, a ruler of the Third Dynasty of the Old Kingdom. These artifacts are generally dated by where they are found, or by whatever poorly scratched or chiselled name is found on them. It's a glaringly obvious technological mismatch between the hieroglyphs and the object itself that I've discussed many times. So Ben makes two assertions here. First he says that the stone artifacts disappear from the timeline after the 3rd and 4th dynasty. And second he says that artifacts generally are dated by where they are found or by whatever poorly scratched name is found on them. Is he correct? Let's consider the second claim first. Is that really how archaeologists date artifacts? I did a whole video on the subject, and if you check it out, you will see that archaeologists date artifacts in many ways. Ben is not only simplifying how they do it, but also presenting it in the most deprecating way so that it sounds silly. So for example, when speaking of how archaeologists date by the science of stratigraphy, he summarizes this simply as, dated by where they are found. And when he speaks of inscriptional evidence, he presents it as dating by whatever poorly scratched name is found on it. It is a common pseudo-archaeological argument that if inscriptions on artifacts are of inferior quality, not only can anything written on them be dismissed without consideration, but we should assume that the writing comes from a different time period and a different civilization than the object. But the fact is, the stone vases found in the Pyramid of Djoser are not dated merely according to what inscription is written on them. There are multiple methods historians and archaeologists use that work in harmony to create a picture of the past. The combination of archaeological, textual, and experimental evidence, along with comparisons with contemporaneous cultures, the examination of the tools, materials, and remnants of workshops, all craft our picture of the past. Yes, many vases come with inscriptions that date to periods in Egyptian history, but a very important way these vases also are dated is by the principle of dating established by the famed archaeologist Flinders Petrie called sequence dating, or seriation dating. Vase styles through time have been established at sites with firmer dates so that we know what kinds of vases were produced when, and thus when we find them placed secondarily at a site, such as in the Pyramid of Djoser, we can ascertain their relative date by matching them to the known sequence. It just so happens that the dates of the kings whose names are on the vases are from the approximate time they were made, as we know from the sequence. Thank you, Sir Flinders Petrie. In the Old Kingdom, stone vases were produced in both royal and private workshops, and the overall production of stone vases was organized by a centralized governmental system. The government oversaw the procurement of raw materials, the distribution of resources, and the establishment of workshops for vase production. This centralized control ensured the maintenance of high-quality craftsmanship and allowed for the development of specialized skills among the craftsmen. Vases were used to store or transport water, wine, and other liquids, and the inscriptions and designs on these vases often indicated the contents and their intended recipients or their owners. Vases used in temple offerings also contained inscriptions and prayers or dedications to deities. Vases placed in tombs were offerings for the deceased, and they would contain inscriptions dedicated to the deceased. In other words, the inscriptions were written, and this cannot be emphasized enough, by the people who used the stone vases, and not by the people who made the stone vases. Look at this sloppily written name on this Buzz Lightyear action figure. It totally doesn't match the quality of the figure itself. Now I ask you, shall we conclude that the action figure comes from a time much earlier than the writing, perhaps thousands of years before? Of course not. All we can conclude is that the maker and the writer are two different entities, and that the writer is the owner of the object. Let's talk about that sequence, what we know of the history of stone vase manufacture in Egypt, and see if Adam is right in his other claim that they disappear after the 3rd or 4th dynasty. Ancient Egyptians manufactured stone vases for over 5,000 years. During this time, there is a rise and fall of different technologies and skill sets, materials and techniques, and changes in function and significance of stone vases in Egyptian society. 
This process is not linear. And yes, there are moments in the 5,000 year history that represent serious setbacks in the craft. These setbacks and the loss of previously honed skills fuel the pseudoscientific theories that push ideas of ancient lost high technology. The working of stone into vessels of various shapes and sizes was one of ancient Egypt's earliest specialized crafts, but not as early as Uncharted X would have you believe. The oldest stone vessels that have been found are from the Badarian period, about 4500 to 3800 BCE, and were used as part of funerary offerings. They seem to have been made with some type of grinding stone, either operated by hand or in the form of a drill. They made vessels out of limestone, sandstone, and travertine, but in this period they also began working with hard stone like basalt. The results are impressive, but certainly not of the quality that would come later. Stone vessels from this period are rare, and rarer still for basalt. They are found in elite burials. The regular folks got regular pottery. Basic tools were used in this era. These included copper chisels, stone hammers, saws, and sand as an abrasive material. The technique of indirect percussion, which involves striking the vase with a hammer and chisel to shape and refine it, was rudimentary and created relatively simple designs with limited decoration. I have to ask, if there were thousands of superior quality stone vessels already in existence at this time, as Uncharted X claims, why have none been found beneath the ground in any of the archaeological layers from this period or earlier? Why are our earliest examples these primitive ones? If the better ones were already made as they believe, and were simply appropriated by the Egyptians, why did they not appropriate them earlier? I mean, surely they would have wanted to use them before they invented hardstone vase manufacturing technology for themselves, right? Let me know what you think in the comments below. In the later pre-dynastic period, hard stone like granite and basalt began to be used sparingly for bowls and vases, but not yet for building or anything like that. During the early dynastic period, new technology emerged, like the rotary or bow drill, which allowed for harder stones like basalt, diorite, and granite to be hollowed out with greater proficiency. The shapes of vases during this period also evolved, with jars, bowls, and cylindrical vessels becoming more common. Stone vases of this time were mainly used to store oils, perfumes, and cosmetics, just as with cheaper vases. The fact that some are stone is indicative of the wealth and status of their owners, and were often used in burials to denote the owner's social status. From this point through the first part of the Old Kingdom, we see the industry at its high point. Materials like limestone, basalt, alabaster, diorite, granite, and schist were now in use, along with rarer materials, such as obsidian, rock crystal, and breccia, which were used to create high-quality luxury items. But yes, by the latter part of the Old Kingdom, as the government decreased in power and wealth, softer stone vases were being produced more than hard stone vases. The decline, which continued past the Old Kingdom, was caused by political instability and fragmentation, leading to a decrease in centralized control and organization. Everything was declining in quality at that time. The production of stone vases experienced a resurgence during the early New Kingdom, the range of shapes and sizes of stone vases expanded, with craftsmen creating more complex shapes. Inscriptions on stone vases also became more elaborate, incorporating prayers, spells, and hymns. Although the centralized control of the industry was not as strong as it was during the Old Kingdom, the quality of craftsmanship and innovation still flourished during this period. Since the production of stone vases was less centralized, a variety of regional styles and local influences in design began to emerge. The development of better tools in the early New Kingdom enabled craftsmen to achieve greater refinement. The early New Kingdom also saw innovations in the use of abrasive materials, with craftsmen employing new polishing agents, such as diorite, dolerite, and quartzite, to create smoother and better polished surfaces. It seems Ben was not aware of this. Hopefully someone will let him know that yes indeed, Hard stone vase manufacture did continue after the 3rd or 4th dynasty. Granted, it went into decline for a while, but it came back. There exists a category of artifacts from the earliest times of ancient Egypt. Hard stone vases, vessels, dishes and more, ranging in size from large to very small. Made from a wide range of igneous stone like granite, diorite, porphyry, slate, schist, cyanite, rock crystal or even corundum, all incredibly hard materials, harder than steel, ranging from 6 to 9 on the most scale of hardness. 
sorry, but hard stone vessels did not appear in earliest times in Egypt. Granite, diorite, porphyry, and corundum vessels are not found in any remains from the Paleolithic period, Mesolithic period, or early Neolithic period. They do not appear until the late pre-dynastic period, around the same time that urbanization was taking place. Slate and schist are not hard. They display truly remarkable characteristics of precision manufacturing. They? Only one stone vase was measured with the tools able even to detect high accuracy. So how can he speak of more than one vessel displaying these characteristics? He can't. No evidence of precision manufacturing has ever been demonstrated before this vase was measured. None. And yet he speaks of it as an established fact. Just to be clear here, in manufacturing terminology, accuracy and precision are not the same thing. Accuracy is how close to the true or proper value the measurement of an object is. This is what the metrologist measured, the vase's accuracy. Precision refers to how well the manufacturer can keep making the same product, or how well a measurement system can keep making the same measurements. In other words, it is about repeatability. Precision manufacturing would be measured by taking two stone vases and seeing how close their measurements are to each other. But this has never been done. In fact, no two identical vases have ever been found in Egypt. Therefore, no precision manufacturing has ever been demonstrated. The lack of similarity between vases indicates that they were made individually and not on a machine that produced them in bulk. Perfect symmetry and balance, immaculate polished and smooth surfaces, machining and turning tool marks on the interiors, and some with an astonishing thinness of material, translucent stone, down to even 1 40th of an inch thick. Truly challenging, as these types of hard stones become brittle when thin, and carving them is no simple task. The stone matrix goes from softer materials like mica or hornblende, to very hard materials like the obvious large quartz crystal inclusions seen on many examples. Found in great numbers in burials from as far back as Mesolithic times, they're often displayed next to bones, beads, and primitive pottery vases, clearly imitations of the hard stone vessels, some even painted to mimic granite. Again, zero burials from Mesolithic times have ever contained any hard stone vessels. In the Old Kingdom, at least some Egyptian workshops could make their stone bowls rather thin. One, made of naturally translucent diorite, is indeed 1 40th of an inch over much of its surface. This is work to admire, for sure. But Petrie describes this bowl as full of minute flaws, so it certainly isn't made with the level of accuracy that Ben is trying to demonstrate. The bulk of these were recovered from beneath the Third Dynasty Step Pyramid of Joseph at Saqqara, 40 to 50,000 of them, and fragments of vases and dishes can still be seen and handled down there today. Many of these are, as I mentioned earlier, inherited and collected from earlier times, even according to the official story. Uncharted X thinks that if archaeologists say that Djoser got it from earlier times, meaning a few generations, this gives him justification to say that they are from thousands of years earlier. A hundred years, five thousand years, what's the difference, right? After the third and fourth dynasty, these objects disappear from the Egyptian timeline, with a very few exceptions. And even then, those are dated to the poorly inscribed glyphs that are found on them. After this period, ancient Egyptian vases were generally formed from alabaster, or white calcite, a far softer stone that is orders of magnitude easier to work, and which can be shaped with simple hand tools. These alabaster vases, while beautiful, do not display the same characteristics of precision that the older hard stone vases do. A scene on a wall found in Saqqara is used by Egyptologists to explain all of the vases, but rather I think it shows the manufacturing of alabaster vases alone, likely a process invented by the polymath Imhotep in order to imitate the amazing ancient stone vessels that they collected in vast numbers. Not only do the alabaster vases not show the same accuracy as some hard stone vases, as we have seen, some hard stone vases do not show the same accuracy as other hard stone vases. We have a variety. So where is the evidence of precision manufacturing? Here is an accounting of the types of stone used in vessel making through Egypt's history. Does this look to you like only alabaster after the third and fourth dynasty? At this point, they get into the details of the accuracy found on the vase. I will not take issue with any of that because I think it's possible the vase is a fake. Let's fast forward and look how he sums everything up. I'm hopeful that these res these results and and I think this discussion can I'm hoping it can move the whole dis I mean the whole topic of of ancient engineering and ancient technology and precision along a little bit because 
you know, I, I don't know. I'd put a challenge out to anybody that suggests you can make this type of thing by hand to, to give it a go and see if you can yeah. get it scanned and, and see how close you get. Document how you do it with the, the primitive techniques and see what, what realm of, uh, of precision thing. you can get into. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical that it's, that it's possible. Let's... He hasn't demonstrated anything yet, except maybe that this one vase isn't ancient Egyptian, and he's already putting out challenges to the opposition. This obviously is premature. Why would anyone need to show that a vase can be made to this level of accuracy with ancient techniques if we don't even know if this vase is ancient? But having said that, I will point out that Scientists Against Myths has so far made three stone vases using so-called primitive techniques, two made of breccia and one made of diorite, the latter as hard as granite, and they have measured them. They didn't have access to the equipment that these guys have, but they did take 3D scans of the vases and found that the diorite vase's deviations from the circle in three sections perpendicular to the axis of the vase are within 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters. The angle between the axis and the plane of the upper end is 89.92 degrees, darn close to 90. Deviation from the flatness of the upper end is within 0.12 millimeters. Now, this is not as accurate as the Adam Young vase, but considering that this is only the third experiment done by amateurs, it is impressive. Consider what could be achieved by Egyptian craftsmen with years of experience. The law of large numbers suggests that even if it was possible, it would have taken a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would dispute that. It could take months, years, whatever. The value would be very high. You know, these wouldn't be cheap pieces for anybody in any in any time period, in any epoch, in any culture, you know, in any part of the world. Yeah, these were luxury items for the wealthy and would have taken months to produce. So how do you take, and I think Lauer was the one that was excavating Saqqara, and he found multiple caches of yep. like 20, 30, 40,000 stacked up like Tupperware. Yep. If they're that valuable, you wouldn't just throw them in the closet and shut the door. I'm not sure what the argument is here. Is he trying to say that the Egyptians didn't value the vases? If they didn't value them, why does he say they tried so hard to imitate them? Should I point out that they are in a royal tomb, a king's tomb, and that many of them have the names of kings on them? I'm kind of astounded that he would think that items placed in a king's tomb would be comparable to throwing them in a closet and shutting the door. This man is revealing his extremely limited knowledge of ancient Egyptian culture, while at the same time acting as if he has a strong handle on it. Ancient Egyptians believed that the ka, or life force, of a deceased person continued to exist after death. The contents of the vessels would help sustain and protect the deceased spirit as they journeyed through the afterlife. We know this because they tell us so in their writings and in their art. So even regular vases placed in tombs had great religious importance. During the heyday of stone vessel manufacturing in the proto-dynastic and early dynastic periods, there was an increase in the distribution of stone vessels to the elites around the Memphis and Abydos areas. This shows that there was an administrative mechanism responsible for supplying not just the royal family, but also the lower-ranking elites and officials with stone vessels. In other words, these were royal gifts, and the greater quality of the vessel, the more treasured the gift. So did Egyptian officials value the stone vessels in their tombs? You bet they did. I, I do think there was a, you can see this in later epochs in Egypt, in particular the, the New Kingdom, 19th Dynasty, where these kings seeing themselves as gods would, would I think, in a lot of cases, reclaim older artifacts. And, and they certainly got in the practice of writing their names on damn near everything. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got statues and, and, and other yeah. like artifacts with three or four different pharaohs' names written on it until you know, Ramses and Meren Ptah figured out that, well, if they carve their name really deeply, then they, can, they make it real difficult for other people to, right. to erase Never. it. Kings wrote their names on stone, yes. It was important for their name to last. How do we decide that a king has appropriated an object? When we have evidence for it, we see physical evidence that it had been used by another person before. But to assume that any object we wish was appropriated is appropriated, when there is no evidence for it, is not science, history, or archaeology. It's simply desire. Now you might say, well, isn't it at least possible that an artifact was made by someone who did not carve anything on it, and then later a person decided to carve their name on it? Yes, it's possible, even plausible. But again, it should not be considered probable unless there is evidence for it. And Uncharted X considers it probable without evidence. 
and he takes these artifacts out of their historical contexts, established by many intersecting lines of evidence, and places them thousands of years earlier in a society never established even to have existed. Now it's not even plausible. Now let's look at some things said in the second video on the subject. I'm very confident in saying that there is absolutely no chance this could have been made by hammering on this thing with pounding stones or grinding on it with sand and flint chisels. The claim that it was is simply preposterous, as any engineer or machinist who truly understands this data would agree, as demonstrated by so many of the comments and emails I've received about the last video. It's heartening to know that so many of Uncharted X's fans express support for his point of view. Since he doesn't seem to know anything about Egyptian stone manufacturing, I think it's appropriate to go over it a bit. We gather information about ancient Egyptian vessel making techniques in three ways. From physical remains, from texts and artwork, which might depict the process or describe the tools and materials used, and from experimental tests conducted to explore the methods of early grinding and drilling. From these, researchers have developed a fuller understanding of how ancient Egyptian stone vessels were made, although new evidence will always augment our understanding of the process. The use of a bow drill with a copper tip to hollow out stone vessels appeared during the early dynastic period, but the creation and use of hollow tube drills in the Old Kingdom was a revolutionary invention that allowed Egyptians to bore holes into many different types of stone more efficiently, including granite. The tube drill is a fascinating invention. Copper on its own is not an extremely sturdy metal, and would quickly deteriorate if used by itself to hollow out hard stone like granite. However, if crushed quartz or corundum is added to the borehole, individual crystals, which are mainly angular in shape, embed themselves into the softer copper for a fraction of a second, and are swept around the stone's surface. This allows the tool to cut harder stone that would normally destroy the copper much more quickly. To hollow out bulbous vessels that were wider inside than at the mouth, craftsmen used elongated stone borers made in a figure eight shape. These borers were driven by a forked shaft and were mainly used to enlarge holes already made by tubular drills. Another ingenious method of drilling also came from this era, known as the twist reverse twist drill technique. This technique was employed as a more specialized drilling method. The twist reverse twist drill technique involved twisting the tool first clockwise by approximately 90 degrees and then counterclockwise back to its starting position, creating a core with parallel sides. This method was found to be more suitable for making stone vases with thin walls as the mechanical stresses imposed by bow driven drills often cause breakage. Think about this the next time someone says that archaeologists believe these were made by hammering on them with pounding stones. So let me just quickly reiterate the challenges involved in manufacturing this object. Not only do the geometric shapes of the various parts of the vase need to be aligned with each other with incredible precision, the surfaces themselves need to be geometrically symmetrical and consistent. Nick Sierra did a great job in the last video explaining just how deformations in these geometric shapes would move their center points and axes around for these areas. But we just don't see that on this vase. And not only that, the material itself represents a tremendous challenge. In this case, it's carved from rose granite. And we know that many other types of very tough igneous rock were also used to manufacture objects like this. It's vastly more challenging to work in this sort of medium than it would be to work in something more homogeneous like steel or aluminium. Granite and igneous stones are made up of matrices of different material with very different hardnesses. Inclusions of extremely hard material like quartz or corundum are surrounded by far softer stuff like mica or hornblende. This represents a huge challenge to the machining process as the tooltip needs to go from soft to hard and back again as it works the surface. You also run the risk of literally ripping out chunks of material as you work it. For example, a quartz inclusion is much harder than the material surrounding it, and it might shatter entirely or just be ripped out of the matrix rather than being cut cleanly. Either the tool itself is so rigidly held in place and so effective that it doesn't matter what material it's carving through, or the force that's exerted on the tool tip needs to vary at an almost microscopic level with the material to get the results that we see. 
neither solution seems remotely feasible with any sort of primitive handwork. It'd be understandable if you heard this and got the impression that he has obtained this information from someone who carves stone by hand, or even a geologist. But he's just riffing. I would ask him for a demonstration of how grinding the surface of any of these stones results in pieces of it being ripped out of the matrix. Then we could see if his comments are based in fact. Maybe before that, he can explain to everyone what tools were used to make all of the imprecise hard stone vases that have been found. And I'm talking about the vases that contain the inclusions he's referring to. As far as I know, this is the first time an ancient object like this has been subjected to this level of scrutiny. You are absolutely right. So how is it that you believed in all of this before an ancient object was subjected to this level of scrutiny? And I hope that it's just the start, as this sort of analysis is sorely needed for many more ancient artifacts, both large and small. So, who's going to do it? I also expected the video would generate a reaction from the so-called debunkers and also from mainstream archaeology, and I definitely saw some of that. The responses, however, went pretty much exactly as I predicted that they would. First, question the provenance of the vase. Then, attack my motives, or the motives of the people involved, or just stoop all the way down to ad hominems, sadly an all too common occurrence as evidenced by the ridiculous statements made recently against Graham Hancock in relation to his Netflix show, Ancient Apocalypse. Failing all that, some people just hand wave it and dismiss it away all as nonsense, which only serves to show just how ignorant they are when it comes to engineering topics. Here Uncharted X mixes a valid concern about the provenance of the vase with ad hominem attacks, as if what someone said about Graham Hancock has anything to do with this experiment. But by listing them together, he can make the question of the vase's provenance seem like it is as superficial as the others. But to everyone watching, it is in fact crucial to this experiment. As I predicted though, these types of responses really only serve to just throw up an objection in order to avoid dealing with the vase scan and precision data. And when it comes to any objection or coherent responses to this data, it's been radio silence. Granted, it's still early days, so we'll see, but the challenge for experimentalists is definitely out there. Go download the STL file, then get your sticks and stones together, document your process, and let's compare results. Good luck. Here again, he puts all the onus on objectors instead of on himself, as if he has already put the work in, and now it's someone else's turn. When he has barely gotten started. The only one of these arguments or objections that are worth commenting on any further is that around the provenance of the vase as a pre-dynastic object, at least 5,000 years old, and possibly, even probably, I think, much older. Okay, so I am glad he has chosen to address this valid objection, which this entire experiment hinges on. If the vase isn't genuine, this whole narrative he has built up comes falling down like a house of cards. When this objection on provenance comes from mainstream archaeologists, as I saw it did, I find the hypocrisy to be utterly palpable. It's akin to somebody setting up their own roadblock and then complaining that it stops them from driving down the road. If you have ever seen papers in experimental archaeology, and how rigorous and thorough they generally are, how they cross all the T's and dot all the I's, you may wonder how Uncharted X could accuse academics of being hypocritical. They only ask him to meet the same standards that they hold themselves to. It is quite literally the academics in mainstream Egyptology who have denied countless requests to analyze and study these objects. And it's the same people who have also expressed zero interest in exploring the engineering or manufacturing of artifacts like these vases themselves. I would ask Uncharted X to present the documentation of all the requests to analyze and study these objects that have been denied. He says countless requests. I would be surprised if he submitted a formal request to even one museum. But I hope he proves me wrong. As for interest in engineering and manufacturing of artifacts, I have at least a dozen full-length books written by academics on the subject, and I'm aware of many dozens of articles, and there are no doubt hundreds more. Every single artifact gets meticulously measured when it is discovered, and these measurements can be found in the archaeological reports. But of course, Ben is not interested in measurements to the hundredth of an inch. 
he demands measurements to a thousandth of an inch because he and his buddies think it is important. Apparently, academics are hypocrites because they did not do the task that he and other fringe theorists assigned to them. It takes a lot of gall to expect others to perform experiments on your behalf, as if you are a teacher assigning homework. Ancient Egyptian museum curators are generally also Egyptologists, and archaeologists control the access to ancient sites and artefacts, and they get to decide who can do what and when. If you want to question the provenance of this vase, then please, let's analyse any of the hundreds of examples currently ensconced in display cabinets gathering dust, those with impeccable provenance. It's a harmless process, and you'd be advancing our knowledge base as well as preserving and digitising the artefact for all time, regardless of whatever motive you think might be behind it. It's this very reason, this denial of access to these artefacts, that our only option to do this type of work so far has been to go out to private collectors. This is baloney. By claiming that no one will let him analyze the vases, he doesn't even have to bother asking to analyze them. He just says, oh, they probably wouldn't let me anyway. You know how these archaeologists are. Tell you what, Ben, why don't you and Alex Dunn prepare an official request to measure some vases and I will help edit the document for you, so that you can get approved. Then you can send it to a dozen museums and see how many agree. How does that sound? I won't vouch for you, because I have no reason to trust you, but I will help you say the right things, including that this will be a real scientific experiment that you will be conducting with no predetermined outcome. Regarding this vase, I'm very confident of its provenance. It's been in private collection, as far as I know, since the 1980s, and I'd question our capability to make this sort of thing with this level of precision in the 1980s. Even machining this today from granite would represent a significant challenge. Okay, so here we get to another important part of his argument. He concludes here that the vase is unlikely to be a forgery because they didn't have the technology even 35 years ago to make it. Of course, this is a premise that is absolutely essential to his conclusion because if he can eliminate the possibility that the vase is a forgery... He thinks the only other possible explanation is that it is thousands of years old and comes from an extinct advanced civilization that no one has ever found. But has he presented any evidence that this was not possible in the 1980s? I know you can't really prove a negative, but surely you can discuss precision machinery from the 1980s and its capabilities with some facts and figures. This information must be available somewhere. But again, he does not follow through. So all we can say at this point is that this is an unsupported claim. Add it to the list. You own the vase and you, you, you um, purchased it. Do you know any more details about its background? So it's, I know it's, it's pre-dynastic. And, you know, I know these artifacts, there's lots of examples of precision artifacts, at least to the eye, that stretch way back uh, into those, you know, Mesolithic times, almost um, prior to the, the first dynasty starting. Now he turns to Adam Young, the owner of the vase, to ask him about the vase's provenance. Finally, maybe we can get some answers that will help clear up this whole affair and put our minds at ease. As a side note, the expression he uses, precision artifacts at least to the eye, is rather funny. According to his own argument, extreme precision, such as could not be achieved by the dynastic Egyptians, cannot be seen by the human eye. Do you, know, do you have any details about where it, came, where it was found or uh, its history at all? So most of the ones that you see in private collection or that come up for auction or for sale, uh, typically the story is it's a European family. There is generally some sort of a diplomatic connection where in the 1800s there was some sort of ambassador diplomatic, uh, you know, relation from that country to Egypt. Uh, normally what happens is the family is selling, there's an estate sale or something, nobody really sees the value in it and it ends up at auction or through a private, uh, through a collector or a, uh, uh, an auctioneer or someone like that. So there's provenance and then there's, pseudo provenance uh what typically the, the more provenance the more valuable um mm -hmm. and they may end up in museums first and so it's it's not always that easy even if there is provenance uh, because of the fear of the government coming back and, and claiming these yeah. um, it, it's sometimes a little bit murky and you just don't see it all that often but uh, my understanding is that a lot of these originally came from Saqqara. did you catch that when ben asks him a direct question about the vase he says most of the ones you see in private collections... So, so right off the bat, he moves away from discussing that vase to talk about what can be said about 
any vase in a private collection. And then he says that if a vase has provenance, then the government might come and take it away. So apparently this means that sellers don't want to tell you the provenance of their artifacts. But he says his understanding is that a lot of these vases, the ones that are found in private collections, came from Saqqara. But again, nothing about this vase specifically. He says many words, but he doesn't give a direct answer. This was a long-winded way of saying, I don't know its provenance, spoken like a politician. He does, however, go on to explain why he thinks the vase might be from Saqqara. This gives us some hope that he received some specific information that will help us to date the vase. So let's see what reasons he gives. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of these originally came from Saqqara. At least oh, yeah. my, my personal belief is that the, that the Egyptians themselves, probably the dynastic Egyptians um, and pre-dynastic Egyptians found these things. They probably dug them up on and around Saqqara. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to have been heirlooms. So you're, you'll normally, when the academics have, have the reason they've coined these pre-dynastic is because they were found in uh, pre-dynastic burials. That's right. Uh, and you can carbon date the, the fossilized or the remains of whoever was buried there, uh, you would normally have seen one, maybe one of these high precision, they're generally granite or diorite or hard rock, igneous rock uh, vessels, along with maybe 20 or 30 less impressive mm -hmm. pottery uh, uh, vases. And so that kind of tells me that this was an heirloom. Yep. Um, it was probably buried with a matriarch or a patriarch of the family. And they were recognized even in, in deep antiquity for, for being really precise and, and, and impressive. So he just tells you his personal belief by repeating the talking points of the pseudo-historical narrative. That's it. That's his answer to the question of where that vase came from. He doesn't know. He just has faith. Um, it's also very interesting that they're recognized as being pre-dynastic. Yeah. Right? That, that's, that puts that um, straight line kind of evolution into question. They're recognized as being late pre-dynastic. Stuff happened before that, Adam. We have stone carving developing all through the Paleolithic, Epipaleolithic, and Early Neolithic, and the beginnings of stone vessel carving in the Late Neolithic before we even get to the Late Pre-Dynastic. To me, it's like this tale of two industries. You have, you have, you have one industry that's, that's primitive with these primitive hand tools, and we have a bunch of artifacts that are explained by that, and I think that's what the scene on the wall shows, and I think it's basically imitation uh, they're, they're looking at, yeah, I think those guys saw these vases and were like, what the hell is this? And and amazed by them, they were immediately valuable. They understood what they were looking at and they tried to imitate them. And then you have this other category of, of artifacts that, that isn't explainable by the primitive tools or by the methods that we, we see drawn on these scenes on the walls. Ben speaks of the existence of two industries. The existence of one of them, that of the Egyptians, is firmly established. The existence of the other one, which created objects of high accuracy imperceptible to the human eye, is based only on the measurements of a vase of unknown origin, and what Ben and his pals saw with their eyes in museums and archaeological sites. Guess what, folks? We only have evidence of one industry. One other thing I'd mention here is, that I meant to mention before is the imitation part. Even in the museum, you see that, like you said, you, you, they were found in these old pre-dynastic burials and next to them were these very unimpressive pottery samples. I've got a few pictures of this because they're, this is literally how they're displayed in the museum. It's amazing. You have a, a very hard looking, a very precise igneous stone vessel, whether it's you know, diorite, porphyry, whatever. Uh, and next to it's like a, a, a pottery vase, not spun, not made on a lathe, put together with hand. And then it's painted and they put dots on it to make it look like granite. Like it's, it's so clear <laughs> that it's imitation. Right? Has Ben never seen a cheap knockoff of a much nicer product? These are ubiquitous throughout the world. And yet he seems to think it is impossible for the Egyptian civilization to have both a quality product and a cheap imitation. If that's true, it would be the only culture in the world ever to have existed like this. Uh, one of the things that I've always maintained, and I think this, is, this holds true for, from a theoretical perspective, is, is that there's, and this was going back to what you were saying, Nick, is, is that there's a relationship, I think, between precision and function. Like there's a... You, you don't develop the, the type of precision that we see in these parts, nor like in the aerospace parts or any number of parts of semiconductor industry, things like that. There's a, there's a return on the cost. You, you, when you develop precision down to these levels, right, that there, you, you do that and you develop a manufacturing process that can support that because you're chasing a return on function. Uh, I mean, do you agree with that? Is that something that, I mean, you guys are do day in, day out kind of thing? That's why we do that? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But one of the interesting things is that once you get to the point where you have the accuracy for those features, why not apply that accuracy to everything? Right. That, that's that's exactly. well within your capability. Yep. It doesn't make it any more difficult to do. Right. So you do that because it makes a better part. That's exactly where I was going to go with this because that's the, uh, I mean that's I I've, I've made this argument about precision and function and I think I think from at least in my perspective and the way I look at it I think there are there are objects and artifacts that come to us from some of these earlier times that may well have a functional purpose now in particular I'm talking about boxes and maybe even some of the architecture and sites themselves they seem to have to me to me at least I think you don't you don't need to have this precision unless there's function but it becomes more difficult to explain a function when you talk about a statue or a vase or something that is relatively artistic and decorative but as you said if you're manufacturing if you've developed a manufacturing process that that can deliver this sort of function then that's kind of what you get right that's that's if you're using that to do this work then y you get this level of uh, of 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 precision it's amazing how much extrapolation is going on here from this one vase they make the argument that stone made with such high accuracy, that is, to one one thousandth of an inch, must be made for some function, and presumably they mean mechanical function. But since they can't see that a vase would have a mechanical function, I think we all agree it is designed to hold things inside it, they conclude that this manufacturing technology was invented for some other objects, such as stone boxes, which also are designed to hold things inside them, and which have never been shown to be as precise as this vase has. And then once this culture already had this amazing tech, they thought, hey, why don't we use it to make vases too? I'd be curious to see how many high-precision aerospace engineering companies today manufacture vases. We, we kind of do this now, right? The car panel parts on, on modern cars are much tighter and the tolerances are much closer because our manufacturing processes support it. Is it really necessary? Probably not, but... But that's it's a result of our manufacturing processes. Yeah, I would agree. I think that would be the strongest argument for the nature of the precision in these vases. And is that the tool is incapable of producing anything less precise. So you know that whichever rotating tool was being used to sculpt this piece has the accuracy to maintain this geometry. I guess they are also assuming that this unknown culture had only one level of technology everywhere and that a workshop that made stone boxes also decided to make stone vases, even though they think the purposes of the boxes and the vases would be completely unrelated. But then that dives into the next question is also with manufacturing, we also need verification. Mm -hmm. So clearly the Egyptians were holding these tolerances consistently and they had to have had a separate system as well to verify. Uh, the precision that we see in this vase, especially with the lug handles, isn't obtainable by hand and if being done with a machine tool how were they also simultaneous, simultaneously making sure that they were being held to within a thousandth of an inch like we're seeing with the scanner now they extrapolate even further they conclude not merely that these precision tools made perfect objects but also that the makers must have had a separate system to verify the precision didn't they just get through saying that the tool and i quote is incapable of producing anything less precise. But now they're saying that the makers needed to verify that the tool did so. I guess the tool was not so reliable after all. I think there's another implication that is really interesting to me is, is that, that if, if you're using this manufacturing process and, it, and given that it's not doable by hand, it's like you, you can also maybe assume that this thing was designed. Like at some point somebody designed this. It's not like there's a craftsman eyeballing this and making it up as he goes along as you might do on a, a pottery wheel or or in some other like a stone carving thing where I'm gonna I'm gonna shape this according to the rock and what I see in it this to me it's like this this had to have kind of been designed and maybe that's also another another explanation for the the, the perfectness that we see in you know the lug handles relative to each other and the top of the vase we don't need to get into the nitty-gritty details of the vase since we don't know if it's genuine but let me just point out that if you look at the lug handles, the holes drilled through them are clearly not at the same angle on both sides. They are not perfect relative to each other, are they? Looks like both the tool and the verification system failed on that one. Those drill holes, they were eyeballed. 
in increasing our volume of scans will be what would be the, the most important piece of determining whether or not this was a standard piece if they had a process in you know in place to continuously replicate this particular piece. I guess the best place to start is to search for a vase that looks like this one. As far as I'm aware, there hasn't been found any two identical vases in all of Egypt. Heck, there hasn't been found two identical stone boxes either. One that would really, for me, be this, the, the smoking gun of sorts would be able to scan each Ramsey's head yep. and overlay the scans to see if they are all identical as we, as we assume them to be. Yeah. yeah, I'll suspect at least. It's strange to hear someone say they assume two objects to be identical, and they mean to a thousandth of an inch, before they have even done the scan. But I'm glad to hear they want to do a proper scan of statues. The measurements Alex's father did and then published in a book were embarrassingly half-assed. Milking it for all it's worth, Uncharted X made a third video about the vase. This was in order to discuss an analysis made of the vase by a guy named Mark Quist and published on his blog. Mark examined the measurements of the vase in detail, and he drew the following conclusions. That this object was fabricated on a highly sophisticated subtractive manufacturing system from a solid piece of granite. That the manufacturing system would require, at the very least, sophisticated mechanical technology and high-precision components. That the manufacturing system would necessarily have been guided by an automated control system, which could read the design as input and produce the required motions as output. That a Turing machine of considerable sophistication would most likely have been employed to create and operate on the design and to finally transfer it to the manufacturing system. I don't know what Mark's area of expertise is, there is no bio on his site, but he seems to be involved with communications hardware, so I can't tell you if this is an expert opinion or not, but the last two conclusions seem a bit of a stretch to me. And I say that because he doesn't really explain how exactly he arrived at them. They seem more like impressions than logical deductions. Anyway, Marian Marchish, specialist in photogrammetry and laser scanning of cultural heritage, double-checked Kvist's work, and also did an analysis, and these were his conclusions. The vase does not have an exact ellipsoid sphere, cone, or cylinder incorporated, and is not vertically symmetrical. However, it must have been strongly fixed in a rotating device to achieve the high-level coaxiality and horizontal symmetry. To confirm the results, analyses of additional scans of various vases are required in order to definitively exclude the production of this particular vase in modern times. I'll leave a link to his full commentary below. To be fair to Mark, I want to point out that he makes this caveat at the beginning. While we cannot yet make any direct conclusions as to who made this object or when it was created, we now at least know a great deal more about the capabilities of the creators of the object. So he does not take a side on the issue of the vase's provenance. Moreover, he says... We hope that a number of similar objects, of which there are thousands in museums around the world, can be scanned with the same or better scanning technology, so that a body of work can be built up around the analysis of these remarkable artifacts. So he realizes the importance of finishing the study too. Let's fast forward and look at the conclusions Ben draws from these measurements, because I think it is illustrative of his pseudoscientific way of thinking. I don't think it's possible to overemphasize just how remarkable these results, or the vase itself, truly are. Not only are we looking at something that is a true masterpiece of machining, carved from solid granite with utter precision down to the micrometer, something that would present a true challenge to replicate even today. Would it? High precision machinery has been around for a while now. It sounds to me like Ben enjoys using this line oh, it would present a true challenge to replicate even today, for only one reason. Because he really doesn't want this face to be modern. But he has shown nothing to back up this claim that it would be difficult to make one today. And as Marianne has said, we need more scans before we can conclude that this vase isn't modern. But it's also not simply just a vase. I could only speculate as to its true intended purpose. Perhaps it was functional or has undiscovered attributes. Perhaps it was part of something larger. Or perhaps it was truly an expression of artistic capability and a mastery of mathematics and geometry. Okay, now this is genuinely funny. Uh, <laughs> hey, maybe there's something more to this vase than meets the eye. I mean, we've meticulously examined and measured every part of it. 
But maybe if we put a special substance or material inside it, it will unlock special powers. Or perhaps it was part of an engine of some kind. A vase. Speculative fantasy. An unavoidable elephant in the room conclusion of this study is that the most efficient way to design the vase is via mathematics. And the only way known to our civilization to transfer such a design into analog output in a manufacturing system is via a computer, and a fairly sophisticated one at that. Even if it were designed on paper, the minute features, like curves from circles with a one millimeter or less radius, circles that fit the radial traversal pattern, and are expressed with utter precision in the real granite of the real object, make such an exercise impossible without the aid of a computer. Notice how he has jumped from saying that the vase could only have been made by precision tools to saying that it can only have been designed on a computer. He takes shaky, unproven ideas as givens and then creates extensive formulations, magnifying, exaggerating, and embellishing the significance of the vase. A vase is a simple, not a complex, design. No matter how much they ooh and ah over it, anyone can see that. But now he says it could only have been done with a sophisticated computer. I've never seen anyone make so much of something so little since Geraldo opened the tomb of Al Capone. Perhaps it goes without saying, but we've left the very concept of achieving this via handwork with primitive tools far, far behind. The precision of relative geometry is one thing, but the sheer level of mathematical interrelation between the base circle sections comprising components of the vase, and the expression of pi and the golden ratio in the object, could only have been achieved by a very sophisticated mechanism guiding whatever was actually cutting the stone. Ben and his friends do not seem to be aware that pi and the golden ratio show up on many objects, including natural ones, without their ever having been devised by the makers. This is because pi and the golden ratio are discoveries, not inventions. This is one of the problems I saw with Mark's analysis and did not see with Marianne's. Mark tends to impose his own understanding of mathematical principles onto the object and then interprets that as an intentional part of the design. He speaks of concepts like the golden ratio being encoded into the object. In defense of this, he writes, it might be possible by extreme luck to have an object randomly show the value of pi or phi somewhere. But remember that all systems in this object are tightly interrelated. Changing one parameter would throw everything else off. Yes, of course it would. But this is an assumption that the way it is, is the way it is supposed to be. Or to put it better, the way he found it is the way it is supposed to be. The fact is, pi exists in every circle. If you draw a circle, pi will be there. And the golden ratio also can be created unintentionally, and I mean unintentionally by the interpreter as well as by the maker. Math is objective, but interpretation of math is subjective, and it has been misused so many times. And imposing one's own chosen system over an object is a subjective choice. For more on this issue, see my video called Great Pyramid Number Magic. Please note Mark's superimposition of the seed of life grid over the vase. I immediately recognized this as a New Age symbol and one commonly associated with what is called sacred geometry. So on Twitter, when someone asked me about the article, I wrote, Whenever you see the flower of life grid, know that you have ventured into the world of New Age spirituality. I should have said seed of life grid. Well, Mark took offense to this statement and said I was using a guilt by association argument. Yes, my comment was provocative, but I wasn't making a statement about him as a person. I was making a statement about what he did. I tried to explain to him, you are arbitrarily imposing a symbol onto an artifact and ascribing meaning to it. Just because you can find correlations or see interesting mathematical patterns and relationships, this does not prove intention. But he would not hear of it, and he called me a complete fraud. <laughs> Note also that unless this ancient machining system had a superior methodology for handling tool changes than our very best machines do, then it was most likely created in a single pass. We're talking about a five-axis mill with utterly remarkable stability and precision, able to shape one of the most difficult materials on the planet. You know what the best methodology for changing a tool is? Changing it. 
Now he's extrapolating further, concluding that the vase was made on a five-axis mill with a single pass. What is this based on? Pure imagination. And he talks about granite as if it is diamond. Granite has been shaped by humans, and this is a demonstrable fact, for thousands of years. And this is because there are many types of stone harder than granite that can carve it. I also want to briefly mention the concept of what's called sacred geometry by many who are familiar with it, as shown in the artifact with the repeated flower of life grids or the appearance of pi and phi. This category is not some crystal hippie woo, as I've seen some disreputable skeptics of this work try to frame it, but is rather exactly as described. Within the bounds of so-called sacred geometry lie the secrets of the universe, the interrelation of objects from the workings of atoms and molecules, to the ratios expressed by DNA and life itself, to the motions of planets, star systems and galaxies. It is the very stuff of our existence, and to dismiss these findings by trying to brand it some sort of esoteric nonsense is, simply put, intellectual weak source. I hope the irony is not lost on you that here Ben defends sacred geometry in his video about Mark Fist research. After Mark took offense at me suggesting he was using sacred geometry. Let me be clear here. The study of sacred geometry, that is, other cultures' beliefs about the symbolism and sacred meanings of geometric shapes and proportions, is a worthy undertaking. But to subscribe to such beliefs yourself is not science. The secrets of the universe do not lie within the bounds of sacred geometry, and such a belief is exactly the kind of hippie woo and esoteric nonsense that Ben claims it is not. I think it's extremely unlikely that we have hit upon a unicorn with the very first vase we scanned. From visual observation, I suspect many more similar artifacts that are viewed in museums might yield similar results, and I'm sure there is much yet to uncover. We are working to scan more objects like these, and some of those efforts are currently underway. I am still very interested in anyone who has access to such artifacts and is willing to have them scanned or analysed. And we have several irons in the fire, so to speak. But if you are such a person, please do reach out. I'm happy to hear that Ben wants to complete the study. He still has a lot to do, and I wish him the best. But the first thing he should do is cross private collectors off the list. Not only because unprovenanced artifacts carry no weight, but also so as not to encourage illegal trafficking. As I said before, if he needs help preparing a request to study authentic vases in museums, he knows how to reach me. So in summary, what can we conclude about all this? 1. The vase that was scanned is of unknown origin. Therefore, it cannot be accepted as a bona fide example of ancient Egyptian stone vase manufacturing. 2. The vase is remarkably symmetrical and accurate in some ways, and unsymmetrical and inaccurate in others. 3. Only one vase was scanned, which means the scan can only provide evidence concerning this specific vase, and not concerning stone vases from Egypt in general. 4. At least three parties involved have a conflict of interest, and did not conduct the experiment in a neutral fashion as is seen, for example, in the manner in which the vase was selected and in the conclusions drawn about it. 5. The study is far from complete, and we have a long way to go before it is. I would love to hear your comments on this, and if you think I missed anything important, let me know. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing here and would like it to continue, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash worldofantiquity. Or, if you want to make a one-time donation, a super thanks would be greatly appreciated. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left a link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.